So if you've been in the accelerated learning space for more than a minute, you've heard about this book, How to Read a Book by Mortimer J. Adler. And so if you've already read this book, you may be thinking, oh, there's nothing left to know about this book. Well, it turns out Adler is a very interesting guy. These are his published works. And I'm gonna explain the importance of all these. That's what he looked like, died in 2001. So we're gonna get it into that in the back half of this video. And we're also going to talk about his little article on how to mark a book. Um, so how to read a book, I'm going to give a quick summary of the four strategies of learning uh, and reading that he talks about here, and explain their ultimate significance, and then put it into the context of his larger work and the importance of sort of what he represents. So uh, the book is split up into four parts. And the four parts actually don't um they don't link up to the four strategies of reading or four types of reading that he talks about so that can be a little bit confusing um talks about the three types of knowledge and he talks about the great books so the great books is basically the great western canon and until fairly recently uh in the west there's been a canon of books going back to ancient greece ancient rome and the European tradition, and he was a big proponent of that. So we're going to get more into that in a bit, and uh, sort of the meaning of a canon itself, and his interpretation and sort of where he was coming from. So his first uh, three approaches are structural, interpretive, and critical. And then the fourth one is synoptical. Okay, so uh, the first one, and I put them in green. So structural is where you're figuring out the structure and the purpose of the book. The second stage is where you're reading to get the arguments. And if you've seen my uh, Sales the Hard Way uh, course, I actually talk about diagramming arguments and uh, issue diagramming. You may have heard of that. Um, or issue mapping, argument mapping. That's uh, That's the more advanced aspect or way of doing this, but you're mapping out the arguments that the person is making with the book. The third is critiquing the book. And this is where you get into critical thinking and you get into the two different meanings of critical thinking. So you have the critical theory, which is looking at power dynamics and uh, political aspects of knowledge and stuff like that. And then you have, which is sort of the newer interpretation the older interpretation or classical interpretation is critical thinking in terms of soundness of arguments. Does the logic make sense? Does do the syllogisms uh, work? Is the sort of structure of the arguments are there faults in the reasoning, facts, or premises? And and so the newer form of critical theory and critical thinking goes to the purpose of the book. So what is the purpose? Why is this person making this argument? What is their purpose? Where do they sort of exist in the social structure and all of that stuff? So uh, those are the four uh, elements or, or ways of reading. And so uh, that's basically what the book is about. And he talks about reading different kinds of literature. So just different kinds of books. What are the variations that you do depending on the type of book? And, oh, and, the, so, and then the fourth one is uh, synoptical. So not just reading one book, but reading the oeuvre of a particular author or the, 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 body of, uh, the body of literature within a certain field. So expanding on a subject, not just reading one book on a subject. And so this is kind of adding a fourth part of, you know, and then he also talks about philosophical benefits of growth of the mind, fuller experience as a conscious being. So this gets into the philosophical, religious, spiritual uh, reasons, deeper reasons for reading and for accumulating knowledge or, or learning in general. So this is his appendix where he puts his great works, you know, his sort of Western canon, Homer, Iliad, Odyssey, Old Testament, various tragedies, Plato, Aristotle, Hippocrates, Hippocratic Oath, which they actually no longer take anymore. They stopped doing that, I think, five or ten years ago. 
Euclid's elements. So when you when you ever see the elements of style recommended as like the key book to to learn how to read, that's based on and there's a lot of books that have elements of X. Those all are sort of harking back to Euclid and his uh, epic work of geometry, his epic synthesis of geometry. You have Cicero, Virgil, Livy, Ovid, Ovid, I forget which one. So you have all these classical Roman and Greek, you have your New Testament, you have St. Augustine, um, Dante, Divine Comedy, Thomas Aquinas, Summa Theologica, Canterbury Tales, Chaucer, Da Vinci's Notebooks. Uh, Bill Gates actually owns some of Da Vinci's notebook pages. Machiavelli, The Prince, uh, Copernicus, Thomas More, Utopia. I've talked about my presidential planning. When you're thinking about planning and even just when you're understanding from sort of a critical theory perspective, when you're understanding different people's purposes and drives for creating content, creating writings, what is the utopia of their political plan? And for your long-term planning, what kind of sort of end goal are you looking to pursue? Martin Luther, 95 Theses, uh, John Calvin, Calvinism. Francis Bacon, The Advancement of Learning, uh, Novum Organum, uh, New Atlantis. I'll probably do a video on, on that. Um, Shakespeare, um, Kepler, Hobbes, Leviathan, uh, Descartes, when you hear Cartesian, that's referring back to Cart, uh, Descartes. Um, John Milton, Blaise Pascal, Pascal's Wager, uh, Spinoza. If you watch my, um, what is the religion of Elon Musk? I talk about Spinoza and his sort of Spinoza's God. And that that's Einstein's God as well. Um, it's sort of Elon referring to Einstein, referring to Spinoza. And I'm sure it goes back to the Greeks or Romans from there. Uh, Locke. Newton, Newton's optics, modern English coming into form, uh, Leibniz, Jonathan Swift, a modest proposal, <laughs> uh, George Berkeley, um, Voltaire, Hume, Rousseau, the social contract, contractualism, Adam Smith, the wealth of nations, the birth economics, in a sense, in a way, Kant, um, Faust, Faustian bargain, uh, Hegel, phenomenal, phenomenal phenomenology of spirit, uh, lectures on philosophy of history. Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice, Clausewitz on War, Don Juan, Lord Byron, Schopenhauer, Tocqueville, De Tocqueville, Democracy in America, John Stuart Mill, Utilitarianism, that's big, Subjection of Women, Feminism, um, Darwin, Thoreau, Walden, Civil Disobedience, Marx, Capital, Communist Manifesto, um, Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment, Brothers Karamazov, uh, Tolstoy, Twain, William James, uh, The Varieties of Religious Experience, big one. Pragmatism, big one. Sort of the father of pragmatism. Henry James, uh, Nietzsche, Gene Genealogy of Morals, uh, Freud, Interpretation of Dreams, so Civilization, Discontents. John Dewey, Democracy and Education, How We Think. Whitehead, uh, Big in Mathematics. 
and then we're getting to the present day. Thomas Mann. If you watch my video on the, <clears throat> and I'll probably do another video on, on the history of uh, American education and coming out of the Prussian model and militarism, Mann was involved in that setting up education in Massachusetts that spread out uh, free K through 12. Einstein. Yeah, once we get to the present, Solzhenitsyn, Sartre. Uh, so yeah, that's his appendix, that's his list. So then let's look at his actual oeuvre, his, his whole thing. So born in a non-observant Jewish family, dis discovered Thomas Aquinas in his 20s, particularly Summa Theologica. And so there's his whole religious sort of background here. Um, not being a Catholic for most of his life on account of his lifelong participation in the neo Thomist movement. But he's willing to consider him a Catholic philosopher. So um, these are so, like, he wrote a huge number of books and um, he was heavily involved in the new Encyclopedia Britannica. And we know Elon Musk read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica, 30 volumes. So each volume is like that thick and there's 30 of them. So you see all this stuff, great treasury of Western thought. So, and, and all those people's names and those key works that I just read through and highlighted some of them those are is in his opinion the key works but look at all these books he wrote so capitalist manifesto sort of going against uh communist manifesto how to read a book so how to read a book comes out pretty early in his career 1940 and the funny thing is this is what most most people have no clue who he is they don't realize that he was involved in this much larger movement um, but you can see he was kind of just messing around in a lot of different kind of eclectic things here. Then he writes this book, which blows up. And then, you know, he keeps going, you know, writing about many different things. And then later in life, he gets into the, uh, you know, great ideas from the great books. How to Think About God, A Guide for the 20th Century Pagan. Six Great Ideas, Truth, Goodness, Beauty, Liberty, Equality, Justice. So key values. The Paideia Program, an educational syllabus. So this is where he starts putting together, he's got the Paideia uh, Proposal, um, Educational Manifesto, so he's starting to get into this idea of, let me put together sort of my idea of what is the canon of Western, uh, for Western intellectuals and just to understand the ideas of the West. So he's starting to put this together. And you can see the great books of the Western world, 52 volumes. Another anthology kind of like this is the Harvard University. I forget exactly what it's called, but it's the sort of cl Harvard Classics collection. Um, and there were big debates on just what should be considered the canon, what shouldn't. Um, Synopticon, an index to the great ideas. So same root word as synopsis, sort of summary. The great ideas today, 17 volumes. Uh, Propadia, I think that's how the, I'm not sure how that's pronounced. Uh, Outline of Knowledge and Guide to the New Encyclopedia Britannica. So the Encyclopedia Britannica itself went through a transformation and Adler was a key component of that where he wanted to put together this sort of, you know, you see this two volume thing here. He wanted to put together sort of an index of all the ideas and categorize them 
sort of like my my whole thing with ta creating the taxonomies and functional tax uh, organization or the Library of Congress or Dewey Decimal Systems. Dewey, I think we saw his name earlier, Dewey Decimal System, that's the same Dewey. He was sort of a librarian and classificationist and taxonomist. Um, so this idea of creating an outline, not just doing things in alphabetical order and just sort of picking out what you think are the most important things, but actually organizing them into a taxonomy. And then you can go look up each individual idea. And that way you have sort of a table of contents of all the great ideas categorized. And that was seen as like, like a separate two volumes of just sort of a table of contents for the rest of the encyclopedia. So he was really, that was his brainchild. And uh, I'll be doing some more videos on on the whole history of the Encyclopedia Britannica and his involvement in that. I'm a little sketchy on the details right now. I read about this stuff a couple of years ago. Um, but yeah, this gives you a good background for who he was. American philosopher, educator, encyclopedist, and popular author. Aristotelian and Thomas Traditions. New York, Chicago, San Francisco, San Mateo, California, Columbia, and U Chicago. Chair served as chairman of the Encyclopedia Britannica Board of Advisors. So, and then finally, this this article is linked to from the Wikipedia, how to read a, how to mark a book, annotation. So these are his strategies. I talk about this in my accelerated learning courses. If you want my most advanced stuff on accelerated learning, I have a course coming out later this year, probably. Uh, just make sure you're on my newsletter and uh, you'll get notified when that's coming out, when that's launching. So underlining, vertical lines in the margins, star, asterisks, doodads in the margins. I like to use stars, uh, one to five stars. Numbers in the margin, number of other pages in the margin. So creating your own sort of custom table of contents, contents or index. Tim Ferriss talks about this, creating your own, own index in the first page of the book, your sort of own table of contents. That's a big thing that I do. Uh, circle of keywords or phrases, circling keywords or phrases, uh, writing in the margin at the top of the bottom of the page for the sake of recording questions, blah, blah, blah. talking about writing in the first pages of the front end papers of the book. So there's usually two or three blank pages at the front of the book and sometimes that many or more in the back of the book. The way books are printed, they're actually printed on very large size pieces of paper and then they're cut up into like eight or 16 pieces. And so there's almost always there's pages left over because it has to be in a multiple of eight or 12 or 16 or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. That's uh, how to read a book. And the funny thing is 1940 book, this is still considered by most people to be by far the most popular book on how to read. And uh, there's a whole tradition behind it of understanding where the ideas of the Western tradition come from um, and these different levels of reading. So uh, big stuff. Let me know what you think down in the comments. If there's other context you would add, do you disagree with anything I said here? Um, do you think there's any other books that sort of compete with this one for uh, sort of the ultimate book of how to read? Um, I think it's amazing how popular this is 80 years old. If you try to think of another book that's this old, that is still this popular, it's really amazing. The, uh, the, uh, its ability to just continue to stay relevant. And I think the other big thing to understand with him is just having that encyclopedic mind. Make sure you watch my videos on Elon Musk reading the encyclopedia and I give recommendations for how to develop an encyclopedic mind. I have another video on how to think like a generalist and the value of being a generalist and what your your profile of skills look like. There's this sort of T-shaped, double T-shaped, other shapes. Um, I talk about that. Uh, and just the, the importance of the Western canon in understanding 
the roots of ideas and how far they go back. And you only really get to that next level of being an accelerated learner when you can trace back ideas and you fully realize how much people are just recycling information. And this is why I talk about, I don't read what's on the New York Times bestseller. I don't read stuff that's just from the popular press because 90% of the time it's just rehash stuff. It's, I forget who said it, but like most of philosophy is footnotes on Plato. So it's like, if you don't realize where a lot of these ideas come from, you're going to think it's new when it's actually not new at all. And it's just rehash. So, um, and that just slows you down as an accelerated learner because you keep on learning stuff that was already there in the classics. And so you have people like this who have found, you know, these are the key works where you're going to really cover most of your bases, at least within the Western tradition. And then you expand by beyond that by looking at what are the canons of other traditions, other cultures. So that's it for this video. Let me know what you think down below. Subscribe. Like the video if you want to get more content like this. Make sure you're on my newsletter if you want to get alerts on my new courses. I also have a mental models course that's already out, and I open up cohorts from time to time. Um, and that's it. Thanks for watching.